so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Well, hello. It's Mia Friedman back in your ears on a podcast called No Filter. Do you like the new music? Have you missed me at all over the last couple of months? Probably you haven't because Kate Langbrook's season in the No Filter hosting chair over summer was such a raging success. You loved her and I loved her and the guests loved her, which I suppose should make me feel a little bit competitive. I'm a very competitive person. And maybe I was secretly hoping that anyone I put in this chair would be shit, but no. I'm joking, Kate's amazing, and I'm genuinely so grateful for how her supreme skill as an interviewer and just her generosity of spirit as a person allowed me a season away from the show to reset. I reset myself, the podcast, my wardrobe a little bit, but that's another story. And I am delighted to say I'm back, baby. I am entirely invigorated and ready to rumble. So what's new around here? Well, We've got a new logo, we've got new theme music, and I'm going to mix up the format a little from time to time because No Filter has been going for eight years now. I've done over 500 interviews, everyone from incredible actresses like Asha Ketty, Naomi Watts, to Wiggles, to Prime Ministers, all sorts of people whose names you know, and even more people whose names you probably won't remember, but whose stories you'll never forget. Now, to pull back the curtain a little bit and explain how I choose who to interview, my filter for no filter, my no filter filter, I guess you'd call it, has always been very unscientific. It's been things and people I want to know more about because I'm wildly curious and nosy. I have an insatiable hunger to know more about people and things. But I also have very basic bitch taste. So I know that if I'm curious about something, it's a pretty safe bet that lots of other people will be curious about that thing too. And one of the things people will always be curious about is sex. Editing my own sex tape. (laughs) It's interesting because again, like, you know, I might catch myself at a weird angle and I'm very self-critical or Maybe I say something stupid in the video. I'm like, oh, why did I say that? Or it's kind of weird, but I mean, it's part of the job. Now, if you Google the phrase, the world's most sexually active woman, as I did in preparation for the interview that you are about to hear, one of the first search results you'll get is a documentary on YouTube called Meet the Fockens. It is about 69-year-old twin sisters called Louise and Martine Fockens who are sex workers in the red light district in Amsterdam. Well, they're not anymore because they retired when they were 70, but when the documentary was made a few years ago, they were still working and they retired after they'd worked for 50 years, during which time they slept with 355,000 men. My browsing history really isn't normal and it would probably get me fired if I had a regular job, which is why this podcast is called No Filter and why I love to host it. This is a story about Australia's most sexually active woman, Annie Knight. But funnily enough, this story is less about sex and more about marketing, which isn't as sexy, but it's possibly more interesting. When I got fired for doing OnlyFans, actually, I didn't tell my mum. Um, And so she thought I was working at this job for like four months after I'd been fired because I was trying to work up the courage. I think what I wanted first was to have a bit of a resume to be like, mum, look, look how much money I'm making. Look what I've accomplished since like I wanted to have that before I told her. Annie is a 27 year old woman from Brisbane who works in the sex industry as a kind of self-employed porn star. She makes her own sex content and sells it to subscribers via OnlyFans. It became hugely popular during the pandemic because thousands of Australians and people everywhere really created accounts hoping to convert homemade content into piles of cash. Didn't quite work out that way for the vast majority of people because OnlyFans really is not the golden goose of the gig economy. There was a fantastic documentary from the ABC 
about OnlyFans, which I'll link to in the show notes. But that really looks at the opposite side and the far more common side for OnlyFans creators than the one that you're about to hear from Annie. But back to my Google search and the descriptor Australia's most promiscuous woman or Australia's most sexually active woman, which is what first pulled me towards Annie's story when I read it in the Daily Mail, who in turn got it from the Kyle and Jackie O radio show. I feel like I'm very sexually open. I'm open to da- I'm down to try anything, really. Anything? Yeah, most things. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, and how old are you? Uh, yeah. I'm 26. So is Annie actually the most sexually active woman in Australia? Great question. And that's another story, one that you are about to hear. And that is where the marketing comes into it. Because everyone on OnlyFans needs an angle, apparently. And Annie tells me that she has really found hers. It goes without saying, at least it should, if you've been listening to anything I've said up until this point, that this is about to be an adult conversation for adult people about adult things. And even though I am very much an adult, I have to say I learned some new things, like what is a cream pie? And it is not a dessert. Who knew? So enjoy that and enjoy my conversation with Annie Knight. I will be in your ears at the end for a debrief. Annie, you wanted to be a brain surgeon. Why? I just think it was this idea that I had ever since I was like 14. I just had this idea in my head that I wanted to be a brain surgeon. I was very good at maths, very good at science. I loved maths. I love science. So I knew I wanted to go into something in like that sort of field. And I'm very much a perfectionist. So I think that's Mm. why I went for brain surgeon specifically. Because it's like the most specialized, most difficult, most high risk. Exactly right. Set the bar high. So then I definitely decided that when I was like 17 and then I finished school and started studying to become a brain surgeon and then obviously things changed. When did they change? They changed probably two years into studying medicine. I just realized I lacked the passion. I didn't love it like I thought I would. Obviously with the amount of study that's involved and obviously the amount of work that's involved with being a surgeon, I just realized I didn't want to waste my life doing something that I didn't love and wasn't passionate about. Mm. So I actually took a gap year, like took a break from studying to figure out what I wanted to do. And then I started doing a marketing degree instead. Did you decide to do marketing with a view to doing something particular in marketing? Was there a part of marketing that was interesting to you? I wasn't really sure what specific type of marketing I wanted to do, but I had an uncle who was the manager of a shopping center and he'd sort of told me about shopping center marketing and that sounded kind of fun and like a bit more broader than like product marketing. Mm. So I kind of had that in the back of my mind and then when I finished my degree, that's what I ended up doing and I did really enjoy it. So when you grew up, what kind of ideas about sex did you have? Like were your parents pretty chill? You know, did you grow up? learning about sex pretty early? No. I mean, we had sex ed in school. I think when I was like maybe seven or something, I asked the question, like, how are babies created? And I remember mum just handed me this book and it was like, what you're meant to give your child when they ask that question. Where did I and come it, from? Probably. <laughs> yeah. It was actually realistic. It wasn't like, oh, the stork delivers the baby. It was like, no, yeah. this is how it happens. There were pictures of naked people and stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. So that's how it works. I mean, my parents were very chill. You know, we weren't talking about sex all the time. And, you know, I just did sex ed in school and stuff. I feel like I had a very normal upbringing in in that respect. So when did you start going on OnlyFans? Did it start with TikTok or did it start with Instagram? Yeah, it started with TikTok first. I was on TikTok in COVID. I started posting TikToks. And then I realized how fun it was and I was getting views. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then I started seeing TikToks of other women who have an OnlyFans page. And it's something that one of my friends had said to me to do. She's like, you should create an OnlyFans page. Like you would make millions. You'd do so well. And I was like, what are you even talking about? What's OnlyFans? And then I went on TikTok and yeah, I saw all these girls saying like they make, you know, $50,000 a month. And I was like, what? Like, that's crazy. Just from posting a few photos of yourself online. So yeah, probably after like nine months of doing TikTok, I finally decided to start my OnlyFans in, I think it was August of 2020. When you were on TikTok, what kind of videos were you posting? Were you doing the dances in COVID or were you already posting kind of, God, all the words I think of is so like Nana, like suggestive content, <laughs> <laughs> spicy content, you would say. I mean, you can't get very no. spicy on TikTok at all, can you? No, you have to be really careful. I've had like six TikToks removed, like my accounts deleted because of 
yeah, just getting banned or whatever. Your whole account they banned. Yeah. What did you post to get banned? Well, like what I post now, I just keep creating new TikTok pages, but I just talk about like my sexual escapades, I suppose. Mm. But back in 2020, when I first started TikTok, I wasn't talking about that. I was just telling story times. Like, I feel like I've lived a very interesting, random, funny life and like the craziest stuff happens to me. So I was just posting that on TikTok during that time. And I mean, a lot of people didn't believe it because they're like, this is crazy. There's no way that that's true. But like, I don't know, the weirdest stuff happens to me. (laughs) Now you can't make money on TikTok, can you? No, not in Australia, which is really annoying. It takes a lot of time to feed the TikTok beast because you've got to make a lot of videos, right, to get following and to go viral. And it's getting harder and harder, yeah. So you decided to do OnlyFans. Whereabouts were you in your career at that point? Was it COVID still? Yeah, it was COVID. I had a job though as a marketing coordinator of a shopping centre in Melbourne and I really loved that job but I was earning 60K a year and I was still living at home and I really wanted to move out and I financially couldn't afford to move out of home. My end goal at that time was to buy a house one day. And I was like, how am I going to buy a house one day if I can't even move out of home to rent somewhere? So that's why I first decided to start my OnlyFans because I was like, 60K a year at this job is just not cutting it. (laughs) So again, for people who aren't familiar with OnlyFans, the first time I tried to find OnlyFans, I thought it was an app. So I went to the app store. I downloaded something that I thought was OnlyFans, but it wasn't. It's actually not an app at all, is it? Can you explain what OnlyFans is to the curious and the uninformed? Yeah, so it's essentially a website with a subscription type model where you can post explicit content and you can either do like just the subscription only and then you get they get all the content for free. So you just post the pictures and the videos and whatever and they get that all just for the subscription price or you can have a subscription and then also charge them extra for each piece of content as well, which is what I do. And then obviously there's the messaging on there as well. So my subscribers get to message me and chat to me and stuff. So yeah, that's basically what it is. What was the first thing you posted? I think it was just a lingerie photo. I started very mild. I started with lingerie and bikini only and then slowly sort of progressed onto the other stuff. Tell me about that progression because at first you posted things for free because the creator gets to decide whether they post things for free or whether they have a paywall and at what point they have the paywall. So it's all very much in the control of the creator. What was your game plan? You're a smart woman. You know a lot about marketing. You obviously didn't just go into it for a lark. You knew what you were trying to do. So what was the strategy? So I knew what my strategy was from the start. No one knew who I was. I was not an influencer. I didn't have a following. I was literally just a nobody. So I knew that I had to have a free page to begin with I would post like lingerie and bikini stuff. And then if they wanted to see nudes or anything like that, they would have to pay extra for that specific piece of content. And I knew that that's how I had to start. And then that eventually once I got to a point where I felt like I was well-known enough and I had a big enough following that I could switch to a paid subscription model, that that's what I would do. And that is what I did. (laughs) How long did you post free content for and how spicy did that get? The free content was literally just lingerie and bikini. So I was always covered, but I would post nudes for a price as well on top of my free subscription. So if they wanted to see me naked, for example, they'd have to pay $5 for that photo. And I had that subscription model for like a year, I think. And then I switched and I started doing like self-pleasure videos and solo play and all of that. And then after about six months of doing that, yeah, I switched to a paid subscription model. So when you switched to paid, did everything become behind that paywall or is, was there still some content free? Everything gets put behind the paywall that's already on the page. Did that make you nervous? Yeah. So I had about 8,000 subscribers when I would, had the free subscription model. And so I knew when I switched to paid that I would lose a lot of them. And I ended up going down to about 700 subscribers at that time. So I lost like so many. But the way that I looked at it at the time was, well, the people that I've lost probably weren't really paying for content. The people that have stayed are the ones that are actually mostly buying the content. And it was a bit stressful for like a month or two there. I think it was like June, July, 2022 that this was happening. But then, yeah, eventually I just put in the hard work and I rebuilt my subscriber count. And now I'm at like 7,000 paid subs. When you say you put in the hard work and rebuilt it, how did you do that? Because if you don't, the thing about OnlyFans is that you need to send people directly there, right? 
So you need to build an audience somewhere else to send them to OnlyFans. Yes. So that was a big part of it. And TikTok was my main source of marketing that Mm -hmm. I was using to get subscribers. And I was doing very well on TikTok at that time. So it was translating very, very well. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is that you need to figure out a way to keep these subscribers. So if you're just posting, oh, one video here or another video three weeks later, like it's all over the place, they're going to be like, what the hell we want consistency. So I was very strict with myself and made sure that I was sending out a piece of content a video, a full video and a photo every single day so that they would see that I was consistent with it and they would want to stay on my page. When you were starting to take the first nude shots that you took, do you remember the first nude shot that you took? I think I do, yeah. How did you prepare to take it? I did my hair, I did my makeup, had my fake tan on. I remember I set it up in my bathroom, I had an ensuite. I don't know. I just took it. (laughs) I was very self-conscious though. Like I think that's really interesting about OnlyFans is when Mm. I first started it, I was very self-conscious. So I was taking these photos of myself and being so critical of my body. And then in the end, I was like, oh, screw it. I'm just going to post it on my OnlyFans, whatever. We'll see what happens. And I was expecting all my fans to be like, oh my God, like you're so ugly or your boobs are too small or like I was expecting harsh criticism. And they were all like, oh my God, you're an absolute goddess. You have the most beautiful body I've ever seen. And I was like, Wow. Okay. (laughs) Are these people who are subscribing who were paying or these were free people? At the time, these were free people. That's so interesting. And were you worried that these nude shots could turn up anywhere? I mean, that's crossing a line, isn't it? Or was sending nudes something that you were comfortable doing when you were dating? I was very scared about my nudes getting leaked and it did actually happen. So I started getting circulated within my social circles and stuff, which was pretty stressful and actually made me stop doing it for a while there. Because anyone can take a screenshot of the content that they see on OnlyFans, can't they? Yeah, it's a shame. It's illegal too, but there's no way for OnlyFans to stop that from happening. And then obviously if they take a screenshot, they can send it to whoever. Does that happen a lot? I imagine it does. Yeah, I've been told quite a lot that I'm in a lot of like boys group chats and stuff. It's crazy how open people are and like willing they are to tell me that (laughs) because it is illegal. And the thing is, if you know who it is and you have proof that they're doing it, you can press charges because it's technically revenge porn. But a lot of the time they're anonymous. So it's not much I can do. How does it make you feel? Very angry. And it's interesting because I've spoken about it on my TikTok before and people are like, well, what do you expect? You put your content out there and it's like, yeah, but I put it out there for a price with my own consent. So people are out there sharing it without my consent to people who have not paid for it and who are sharing it with malicious intent. They're not sharing it being like, oh, look how great this is. Like, I love this girl. They're sharing it because they're talking crap about me. When you said you took some time off for a while because it was upsetting you that it was going in circles of people that you knew, were you angry then or did you feel a bit ashamed then? I was so ashamed. I like really went into my shell during that period and I had a lot of social anxiety. Every time I would go to a party or I would go out somewhere, I would see people whispering and pointing and like people I knew as well. So it was really stressful and yeah, it caused me a lot of anxiety at the time, which obviously wasn't fun. (laughs) You had a group of friends who you say were very judgmental of you at that time. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. So I had a group of friends who I had known since I was five years old. We went to school together. We'd been best friends. There was probably like seven or eight of us, very tight knit, had grown up together. And when I first started my OnlyFans, one of them called me and basically just was like, you've lost your mind. You're absolutely crazy. You're going to ruin your life. Like what the hell are you thinking? I can't believe you're putting this out there. And it was just really horrible to me. And then I got off that phone call and I never heard from them again. What do you think was going on for them to have that kind of reaction? I always knew they were very judgmental. I mean, I went to an all girls private Catholic school. So a lot of the people there are very judgmental and have grown up with these certain ideals and whatnot. So I think a lot of them, yeah, were just super judgmental. They'd grown up being told that like doing that kind of thing is beneath them and it's embarrassing and it's for people who don't have any money and all of that. So uh, yeah, I think that they were just like, they just didn't understand it. You grew up in the same culture and the same context. How come you didn't feel that way? How did you escape that level of judgment? 
I think it's because it's the way my mom has raised me. She always raised me to be non-judgmental and to accept everyone for who they are and what they do. And that's how I see the world. I don't know why someone who is a sex worker is less important than someone who works in an office job. At the end of the day, I'm the same person on the inside. And that's what I, I think I didn't understand with it at the time was, you know, these girls have known me for it would have been 18 years. I don't understand why all of a sudden, just because of what I was doing for work, that changed their view of me. Like, I haven't changed on the inside, so it didn't make sense. Up next, I had questions for Annie about the difference between when she's having sex as content versus sex for her own personal pleasure. It's work. People forget that this is a job. So we're thinking about the camera angle, where the camera's going to be positioned. It's it's like, you know, okay, what position are we doing next? Okay, do you think the subs will like this? And she also tells me how she finds people to have sex with on camera and how her parents found out about her new career. Very awkward. Stay with us. Were you single during this time while you were revving up your OnlyFans? Yeah. How did commodifying your sexuality change how you felt about it in real life or didn't it? Like was there OnlyFans sexual Annie and private life sexual Annie or was it all just the same? No, it's very different. And Anyone who is a sex worker and works in the OnlyFans industry will tell you the exact same thing. You have like your work sexual you and then you have your home life or personal sex life. It's very, very different. Even when I film a video with a guy, that experience is so different to when I'm, even if I was sleeping with the exact same person, if we were to sleep together off camera in my personal life, it is just so different. Tell me exactly how it would be different. Well, it's work. Like people forget that this is a job. So we're thinking about the camera angle, where the camera's going to be positioned. Okay, what position are we doing next? Okay, do you think the subs will like this? It's very much Mm. like you have to think about it the setup and the lighting and all of that. A lot of the times you don't kiss either. So it takes away that personal aspect. Whereas in my personal life, obviously, you know, you kiss and it's more intimate. There's no camera there. So you're not being like hyper aware of that. You're just sort of living in the moment. It's more passionate. It's just a bit more personal, I think. When did you start having sex with other people on camera? Like all the way along, did you sort of say to yourself, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. And did that line keep moving? (laughs) Yeah, it started with, this is just going to be bikini and lingerie content and that's it. And then next minute was, oh no, I'll do some nudes, but then that's it. And then it became solo content. I did do solo content for two years. Can you explain what solo content is? Yeah. So solo content would just be like self-pleasure videos. So me pleasuring myself on camera, no one else involved. So I did that for two years without ever doing what we call a collaboration, which is when you collaborate with another creator or even a non-creator or whatever. So the line in the sand was you self-pleasured for two years. And then I imagine that next phase was a big step. It was huge. And I was like very nervous because, yeah, it is just so different to sex in your personal life. But also I was just nervous to put it out there and have people ask questions and I guess receive more judgment for doing that because it is a huge step just going from solo play to doing collaborations with other people. But I thought, you know, my subscribers have been asking for it for so long and I want to make more money. So you got to do what you got to do. And now I've been doing it for two years. <laughs> I want to ask about identity. When you started on OnlyFans, at first you were a woman who worked in marketing, who was posting some images as a side hustle. When did you start and did you start seeing yourself in a different way, either as a sex worker or someone who works in the sex industry? Or did you just, and do you still just see yourself as an influencer? How has that idea of yourself changed through these different kind of levels of your OnlyFans content? Well, I think when I left my job as a marketing manager, I was like, right, well, I'm doing OnlyFans, which makes me a sex worker. And I owned that. Like there was never a doubt in my mind that I was going to be ashamed or embarrassed to say I'm a sex worker. And I stand by that to this day. I definitely dabble in influencing, especially like two years ago. I don't do it as much anymore. But yeah, I mean, my title is a sex worker. When you lost your job, that was because of your OnlyFans, right? How did that go down? I'd only started at this new job. I was on day five. They told me they'd done all the checks and stuff on me beforehand. And 
I wasn't necessarily hiding my OnlyFans because I honestly was at the point where I was like, I don't really care. If I do get fired for doing it, so be it. <laughs> Did you use the same name everywhere? I go by Annie Kate on my OnlyFans. I know because I joined OnlyFans to look for you and I had no luck. I was very confused. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it is very confusing. But yeah, so I don't really know how they found me because I, I didn't promote my OnlyFans anywhere at that time either. That must have been like a whistleblower trying to shame yeah, well, you. I think, yeah. Well, on day five, I, I went home sick because I've got endometriosis and I was in a lot of pain that day. So I went home. And when I got home, I had an email from my boss saying that I'd been terminated. And then they listed three reasons why. And one of them was that I'd lied because earlier in the day they asked me if I had any side hustles or side businesses and I said no and then also that I had a a website containing explicit content and crude language and then there was some other reason that I can't remember. (laughs) Did you push back? No (laughs) I was upset but I was upset because I was angry that people could be so discriminatory. Mm. I was angry that they were discriminating against me, but I wasn't actually angry that I lost my job because I hated it anyway. I really did. And I was only on day five. So Why I did feel you like hate it, it. What was so bad about it? Well, I was tucked away in this dark, dingy office at the back of the building and I barely spoke to anyone and the shopping center was pretty crap, if I'm honest. <laughs> so I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the people I was working with. And I'd actually called my best friend the day before crying, saying, I hate this job so much. I just want to do OnlyFans full time. And he was like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. You'll ruin your life. And then, yeah. So it wasn't him that dobbed you in? No, no, (laughs) definitely not. In terms of, um, you know, you consider yourself a sex worker. You are a full-time content creator on OnlyFans. Did you feel that it was something you had to announce or share? Or did you just think it's no one's business? That's interesting. I think it really depended on the person. Still to this day, if it's like a middle-aged person that I'm literally just meeting very briefly and they're asking me what I do for work, I'll say influencer. I'm not ashamed of what I do only because I cannot deal with the millions of questions that follow because there's always a million questions and I just answer them the same every single time and I'm honestly a bit over it. (laughs) What do people say straight away? What are the questions that they just keep asking? They're just like, oh my God, when did you start that? What type of content do you do? You know, do you enjoy it? Like how much money do you make? You know, just the same old questions. And obviously, usually when it's older people, they tend to be a bit more judgmental. And I tend to be a little bit sassy and sometimes a little bit snappy. And if it's not the right situation for that, then that's when I say I'm an influencer instead. (laughs) So back to the decision to do it with someone else. So then how do you decide who to do it with and what happens next? So I decided that I didn't want to start doing content with another creator because I felt very like amateur still. And I was kind of intimidated with doing it with like a big time male creator. So I decided to go on Hinge instead and go on a couple of dates with a guy and see if I felt comfortable with him and he was the right guy. And I managed to find one pretty quickly. Uh, And this is when I was living up in Brisbane. And yeah, once I felt comfortable with him and he agreed to it all and consented to it all and signed all the relevant forms. Yeah, we started filming content together. Annie, how does that come up in conversation on a date? It was in my bio. I've always been open about it. I would rather put it out there. So on my Hinge bio, I have that I do OnlyFans. Okay. So he probably did his due diligence before he went on the date, knew who you Mm -hmm. were. Was he a subscriber? Was he a fan? No, he didn't know who I was. How are you wary of that? Do you have to be on the lookout for that? In your dating life? Yeah. In my personal life, when I'm dating, I, it sounds bad, but if someone is a subscriber or a fan, I sometimes get a little bit scared just because you never know what their intentions are. Of course. Yeah. So I do have to be careful of that. Um, How do I you do, vet that? I mean, you can't. Sometimes I match with guys who pretend to not know who I am and then they do know who I am and they actually subscribe to my page and it sort of comes out eventually. Or I'm pretty good at telling now. There's just a vibe that I get that's pretty obvious. (laughs) Once that happened, does it increase your subscribers? You you were saying this is what your subscribers wanted. So do they pay more to see what they've asked for? Or is it just you have to keep giving them what they ask for to keep them subscribing month after month? No. So I, yeah, the first time I did, we call them a BG, which is like code for boy girl video. Um, I like released it for like a hundred dollars. Like I charged super high cause they'd been asking for it for so long that I was like, they're going to 
pay for this. And then eventually over time, obviously I've decreased the price a little bit. And now I sell it for like $35 USD. But yeah, like you do have to be consistent with it, I think, in order to be able to keep your subscribers. How long is that video that you sell, for example? It depends. Sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's 30 minutes. And do you edit it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You edit it yourself? Yeah. What's that like? Editing my own sex tape. Yes. (laughs) It's interesting because again, like, you know, I might catch myself at a weird angle and I'm very self-critical or Maybe I say something stupid in the video. I'm like, oh, why did I say that? Or <laughs> it's kind of weird, but I mean, it's part of the job. Do you use filters? On my videos, no. Are there filters that you can use? No, it's funny. Yeah, I don't think so. Is there like a, a, a Brazilian bikini wax filter? <laughs> I don't think so. And so what about your parents? Tell me about them. Well, yeah, interesting stories, both of those. So when I got fired for doing OnlyFans, actually, I didn't tell my mum. She thought I was working at this job for like four months after I'd been fired because I was trying to work up the courage. I think what I wanted first was to have a bit of a resume to be like, mum, look, look how much money I'm making. Look what I've accomplished since like I wanted to have that before I told her. When you say a resume, you wanted to have proof that financially it was a good idea, not like look at all these videos that I've made. Here's my, here's a selection of my work. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wanted her to see that I was going to be financially okay. Yeah. Which is funny because I was about to tell her, I was probably like one week off telling her, I was figuring out what I was going to say. And Seven News posted a, a media release, I suppose, on Facebook. And it was a big picture of me OnlyFans model gets fired or something like that. And my mum's seen it while scrolling on Facebook and she goes, that's my daughter. Like, what's she doing there? And obviously she read the article. So you told that story on TikTok and they just picked it up? Yes, exactly. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Mum didn't speak to me for two weeks and eventually she took my phone call and I said, okay, what are your, what are your worries? What are you worried about? She was worried about stalkers. She was worried about what I'm going to do in five years or what's going to happen when the money dries up or what's my future plan? How am I going to find a partner? And all that kind of thing. What am I going to tell my kids when I have them? And I had an answer for literally every single thing that she brought up. And once we had that phone call, ever since then, she's been 100% supportive. I suppose as a parent, was she worried that you didn't understand the, the longer term consequences of what you were doing? Yeah. And I, I and I explained to her, I was like, mom, you need to understand. I've been thinking about this for years. Like I have thought about every possible pro and con and I've weighed it all up and I know that this is what I'm meant to do. What have you seen in the industry, the sort of the downsides? Because you're obviously very successful. You've got a really clear head on your shoulders. You know exactly what you're doing and what you're not doing. Have you seen some some pitfalls and some traps that you've specifically tried to avoid? I think I started at a time when it was very easy to be successful quickly. Obviously not to the same degree that I am now. What I see a lot these days is these girls thinking that they're going to create an account and become millionaires overnight. And that is not it. Like you have to work so hard to get followers, to get subscribers, to make sure your videos, like your social media videos get seen and really make a name and a brand for yourself. It is such hard work and people really don't realize that. So I've seen a lot of girls start an account having this idea in their head and then you know, realizing, wait a second, it's actually so much harder than I thought. There's, this is too much work. I'm not being successful. And they try and go back to a job and they can't because they've gotten enough coverage or enough media coverage or whatever that, you know, that, that no one will take them back. So that's something I see a lot. That's really sad. You've said that it, it's been the news stories that have really been the mainstream media stories, the Kyle and Jackie O, the, um, the Daily Mail, those kinds of stories that have really, uh, put a rocket up up under your success, right? Because without that, would you have just sort of ticked along? Yeah. Like I, th- I was obviously doing well for myself to put it into like numerical, I don't know. Yeah. Before all of the success, I think I was in like the top 0.8% on OnlyFans and now I'm 0.02%. So like that, it doesn't sound like much of a jump, but that is like a huge leap. Yeah. Um, so you're pretty much the top of the tree now. Yeah, the only, the next level up is 0.01, which is like your Anna Pauls and your Michaela Tester type vibe. And what do they do that's different to you? 
well, they just have a huge, completely loyal international following that is like obsessed with them as people. They have a lot of female fans as well, which is hard to tap into. Is their content as graphic as yours? No, I've subscribed to both of them. And I know Michaela does, but Anna, not so much. I wanted to ask you firstly just about your father your yeah. and the Daily Mail turning up on his doorstep. Mm-hmm. How did that roll? Yeah, well, that was also not the best way for my parents to find out <laughs> what I do. I sort of left my dad in the dark for a long time. He didn't know what I did for work. He knew that I wasn't doing my job anymore, but he thought I was just doing influencing and stuff full time. Just because, I don't know, he was my dad and he's he's a lot older. He doesn't really understand things. And I don't know, I just was a bit unsure of how he would react. And he's sort of off social media a bit, so didn't think he would ever find out. And honestly, he didn't until the Daily Mail showed up at his door in October of last year asking for comments on his sex addict daughter, I think they said to him. And he called me up and was like, why did I just have the Daily Mail knocking on my door saying that my daughter is a sex maniac? What is going on? And my heart just sunk and I felt so sick and I just wanted to cry because I felt so bad that they had invaded his privacy like that. Worst of all, he didn't know what they were talking about and then they took that story and ran with it. And that, yeah, that they told him rather than me. So that would have been really hard for him. But we had a chat on the phone and like my mum, he was just super supportive and he understands it all. And I think once he knew how much money I was earning a month, he understood it a bit more. (laughs) Can you explain the difference between if there is indeed one, OnlyFans, porn and sex work? Sex work's quite broad. It could be anything from stripping to escorting to OnlyFans, anything in that sort of, those sort of areas. OnlyFans itself is when you're just online, like a digital creator, which is what I am. I guess you could call what I do porn as well, but obviously there's more mainstream porn, which is like on those sites like Pornhub and all of that, which is free. I don't do that. It's very different business model to OnlyFans. Can you explain the difference in the business model? Because your life and what you describe is very different to what people would think of as a traditional porn star. I can't speak too much because I haven't looked into the porn hub and all of that too much. But I think I am my own boss. I work for myself. I charge a price and it is only my content being featured on that page. Whereas on Pornhub, there is amateur stuff, but a lot of it is like overly produced. They have like a big production crew. You're not necessarily working for yourself. You might be getting a cut as a porn star, as opposed to me who I get to keep 100% of my money. So yeah, that's, those are like the major differences. But if I wanted to, I could post my videos to Pornhub as well. But I personally choose not to do that because I feel like it's taking away revenue from my OnlyFans. Mm. In terms of the slippery slope, I imagine that you're offered more and more money to do more and more extreme things. Is that is that right? On OnlyFans? Yeah. 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 I'm, I've been offered quite a lot of money to do things that I'm not comfortable doing. Like what? Oh, like a lot of custom videos, which is when a subscriber will say, hey, I want you to make this video personally for me. And this is what I want you to do. And I'm not comfortable doing it. It might have something to do with like BDSM or urinating or defecating, that kind of thing. So that's not for me. And that's where I definitely draw the line. Do people also say, I'll pay you X amount of money if you'll have sex with me? Yep, all the time. And it's very annoying because if I was to go back and say, yes, let's do it, which I never would, OnlyFans would ban me from the site. Really? Because it's you're not allowed to organise meetups and you're not allowed to organise that type of thing, which, you know, makes sense because obviously there's like safety reasons and all of that. So they can't be held liable. Yeah. Still to come, I asked the question, Annie, how much money do you make? She was very open, very honest about exactly how much she makes per month. And it's a lot. I have bought two properties And I have saved quite a bit of money for travel this year. And I am now currently trying to pay off both of those mortgages on those properties, hopefully in the next year, if I can. I want to ask you about marketing. Your business brain is obviously still whirring along. Yeah. Your your content at first, I've heard you say, was kind of girl next door. Everybody has to have an angle on OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. 
I imagine Girl Next Door is fairly common, fairly easy to do, fairly, yep. you know, basic entry level. When did you come up with the idea of Australia's most promiscuous or sexually active woman? It was probably like early, or not early, early to mid last year, so 2023. And it didn't start with me thinking, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, start making these crazy videos. It sort of happened slowly. I was like, oh, this happened to me. I'll share it on TikTok. And then that video just went super viral. And I was like, okay. Actually, you know what what happened? I was like, I'm going to go back to my old videos that I used to make, which were more storytelling type vibes because they used to do really well and thirst traps and all of that just aren't cutting it on TikTok anymore. So yeah, I just thought, oh, well, this happened to me the other day. I'll share that on TikTok. That went viral. I thought, oh, I'll do it again. And then that went viral and it kind of just kept snowballing until like, you know, Carl and Jackie O were asking me to come on their show and things just sort of went from there. (laughs) What sort of stories were you telling just about sex? Yeah, my sexual experiences. Yeah. And what made Kyle and Jackie O's producer pick up the phone? I think she just saw me on TikTok and thought, we love how sex positive this girl is. And, you know, I've never heard of someone have this kind of goal before or not. I don't even think I had a goal at that point. She just saw all the all the videos I'd been making and then called me up and was like, we absolutely love that. We're very sex positive at Kyle and Jackie O and we want to hear more about it. And then I went on their show and that's when I mentioned that I'd slept with 300 people in a year and that's where the title came from. (laughs) Did you sort of give yourself that title or was that a Daily Mail creation or a Kyle creation? That was a Kyle and Jackie O creation. They came up with that title and they approved it with me first. They said, are you okay for us to call you this? And I was like, go for your life. (laughs) Did you feel like you had to tell anybody? (laughs) I called my mom before I did the interview (laughs) to tell her, hey, mom, just so you know, this is coming out. We spoke about it beforehand and obviously, yeah, she was like, do what you got to do. That's that's fine. (laughs) What happened then? What was your OnlyFans subscriber account numbers before? And then what was the trajectory afterwards? I think my subscriber account before was like 1,000 or maybe 1,200 actually. Paying how much? How much were they all paying? $15 $15 a month. Mm-hmm. And then I shot to 12,000 subscribers. So big jump. And also $15 a month. So going from being famous on OnlyFans to being mainstream visible, the Daily Mail loves you, does lots of stories about you. Australia's most, I just thought the word promiscuous was such a, <laughs> such a Bridgerton <laughs> word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're so promiscuous. That obviously became something that worked. At what point did you hire a publicist? In October last year, my publicist is actually um, she was a in in the industry herself um, and decided to create her own PR agency, um, Million Billion. And as soon as I saw she created a agency, I thought I want to join. I've seen how much publicity she gets for herself or had gotten for herself, and I want to keep the the ball rolling. I want to keep on top of this, I want to make sure I'm still making this amount of money that I am now. Yeah. That's sort of when I hired her, I think it was, yeah, like October and she's been great. How much money are you making? Anywhere from like 200 to 250 K a month. And what do you do with that money? I have bought two properties. Um, and I have saved quite a bit of money for travel this year. And I am now currently trying to pay off both of those mortgages on those properties, hopefully in the next year, if I can. When you met with the publicist, did she say, what do you want to achieve? What are your goals? Yeah. Yeah. We had a big chat about what my goals were and yeah, where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And what are your goals? I just want to keep getting bigger and bigger and be able to, I guess, make a name for myself. One day I would love to own my own business. I've always wanted to have my own business, but I want to make sure I have enough of a reach to be able to do that successfully. I would love to do a bit of like a bit more mainstream media. I have my own podcast, Double Dose, that I absolutely love doing. So, you know, doing stuff like radio stuff, I would absolutely love. When you say you start your own business, I mean, you have your own business now, right? You are you're your own business, but do you mean like sell products? Yes, exactly. Like what kinds of products? Well, I used to own a swimwear brand that I'd started myself for myself uh, 2017 and I did that for three years and I loved it, but I had to stop because I started working in marketing full time and I just didn't have the time to keep doing it. 
So I would love to do something like that again, whether it be, you know, clothing, swimwear, Mm. anything like that. When you said you're busy and you don't have much time, Mm -hmm. what does a day look like? How much, how much of a day is spent creating content and how much of it is on admin? Most of my life is admin, media, traveling. Like I do a lot of traveling back and forth from like Melbourne, Gold Coast. I mean, I'm in Adelaide at the moment. Why do you have Uh, to travel? Well, a lot of the time I do collabs in different states. I also have family and friends in different states as well. So trying to spend my time with them as well. And how do collabs work? Collabs, I guess like if you see a creator online that you think might look good with you in a video or maybe you've gotten requests on your OnlyFans saying, hey, I really want you to work with this creator and you get multiple requests for it, then you go, okay, cool, well, let's do it because it will obviously sell well. And that's when I might fly down to Melbourne or fly somewhere to do a collaboration. Friends, that was not the end of my conversation with Annie. I had more questions. We kept the microphones going to record some extra content for our subscribers. But yeah, I think also there was an element of, you know, I've got a goal and I want to I want to achieve it. Once all the all the headlines came out, I was like, okay, well, what can I do next? It's going to up that. So yeah, it kind of became a challenge for me. <laughs> Men like to see you with a dildo, maybe cowgirl, reverse cowgirl, that type of thing, or doggy or... By yourself, um, reverse cowgirl. Yeah, like that type of thing. I offer the girlfriend experience. I think going back to that whole girl next door thing almost, it's like that's the appeal to me is that it it does feel like they sort of have a girlfriend. But before I tell you about what else I had to ask her, I just want to set the scene for you a little bit, which I probably should have done at the start. But because podcasting is a visual medium, you might not have seen the clips that we put up on social. Let me describe to you what I was looking at during that conversation. I was in the studio at Mamma Mia with my big cup of tea and Annie was in a hotel room in Adelaide and I could see the bed in the background and I kept glancing at it and thinking about what had probably just gone on in that bed, on that bed, around that bed, against that bed earlier in the day. And look, I guess you could say the same about anyone's bed really because, you know, that's where most people do have sex. But the fact that she says she slept with 300 people last year, I had questions about how that actually worked, plus her goal for 2024, which is fairly ambitious. And of course, I needed to know what a cream pie was. She mentioned it. I didn't bring up cream pies. How could I? Didn't know what they were. I do now. And you will too, after you listen. So subscribers and anyone else who wants to listen, there is a link in the show notes. You can do it right now. Maybe you've had enough. Maybe you just know all the things you need to know. Maybe you already know what a cream pie is. Go you. This episode of No Filter was produced by Gia Moylan and Kimberly Bradish with sound production by Leah Porges. I'm Mia Friedman and it is a privilege to be in your ears. 